Lucky me, no more child-rearing expenses. Let's get divorced. I was utterly shocked when John suddenly dropped those words on me while we were preparing for a funeral. I knew he was selfish, but this was beyond anything I could have imagined. There's a woman I want to marry, but she doesn't want kids. So what if Charlie is alive? I'll keep losing money on child support and medical bills, right? Ah, what a relief. How awful I felt a chill run through me that this man was Charlie's father. My head cleared, but my insides were boiling. I agreed to the divorce. Yeah, then I'll take the house. So get out as soon as you can. Just wait until the funeral's over. Fine with that, John left on the day of the funeral. I read Charlie's will. Jan turned pale while relatives G.L. glared at him with fierce faces. It was time for a counterattack. My name is Natasha. I'm a 42-year-old housewife. I used to work in a company as a translator, but now I switched jobs and work freelance. My husband, John, is three years my senior, 45 years old. We got married when I was 29, back when he was a client at my company. The next year, our son Charlie was born, but John was a very selfish man and hardly took part in raising him. Charlie was frail from birth, in and out of the hospital. I often felt guilty for not being able to give him a healthier body, but Charlie bravely faced his treatments and managed to hang on for 12 years. His condition worsened around the time he turned 12. During his first rainy season, he couldn't stop coughing, his body rejected food, his fever wouldn't subside. We rushed him to the hospital and started treatments, but his symptoms didn't improve much. Mom, sorry for being hospitalized again. Don't be sorry. You're going to get better, right? Yeah, I'll try my best, Charlie said with a weak smile. I felt tears welling up, but I couldn't cry in front of him. I held it in as best I could. When Charlie finally fell asleep for a bit, I called John, but no matter how many times I called, he didn't answer. Maybe he was at a business meeting, so I switched to messaging. John's reply came the next morning, seeing his message. I called him immediately. This time he picked up right away. What now? So early in the morning. Don't what now me? Why won't you come? Charlie's fighting so hard. Well, my being there won't cure his sickness, right? And hey, the hospital bills must be piling up again. Tell the doctor to charge him as soon as possible. What? How can you say that? Ah, can't hear you. I'm off to work now. Wait. John hung up without listening to me. He'd always been indifferent towards Charlie, but he'd never been this cruel before. I clenched my phone, shaking with anger. Even as the rainy season ended and summer began, Charlie's condition didn't improve. The doctors doubted he would make it to winter, so I cut back on work to be with him as much as possible. Mom, you've been with me from morning to evening lately. Is your work okay? It's fine. I'm managing everything from home, so don't worry. If you say so. Charlie didn't seem convinced. He probably thought my work had dried up because of him. After that conversation, to avoid causing him any more stress, I started bringing my laptop and working right in front of him. Charlie loved books and spent most of his days reading. He also liked studying and would join the hospital school when he felt up to it. I wanted to let him do anything he wished, but John, on the other hand, seemed very displeased with me. Not only avoiding visiting Charlie, but also constantly complaining at home. A, is that kid still not discharged? Staying in a private room, huh? What a waste of money. How can you say that when your son is fighting so hard? Why don't you visit him for once? I'm busy, okay? You visiting him is enough. John never changed his attitude and never visited Charlie in the hospital, even though he was Charlie's father. 
I knew Charlie must be feeling lonely, but I understood that forcing John to visit against his will wouldn't help, so I didn't push it further. By this time, John often came home late, reeking of alcohol. He claimed it was for client entertaining, but the lipstick on his laundered shirts and receipts from motels hinted at an affair. He couldn't make time for Charlie, but had time for some other woman. My love for John had run out, but I feared that divorcing him would sadden Charlie. I thought so and endured it. Meanwhile, Charlie's condition worsened. Called in by his doctor, I was told something shocking. I'm sorry, but he only has about a month left. What? Doctor, isn't there anything you can do? There's not much more we can do. As I broke down in tears, the doctor assured me, we'll do our best till the very end. For about half a month, we continued treatment, consulting with the doctor, but as expected, Charlie's body weakened further. Am I going to be gone soon? What are you saying? There's so much more you want to do, right? I encouraged him with those words, but cried in private, away from Charlie's sight. Finally, when the doctor said that further treatment was pointless, I decided to take Charlie home to spend his last moments. Are we going home? Yes, the doctor said. A change of scenery for a few days would be good. Yay! Charlie's weak yet childlike response made me fight back tears. I told John about it, but all he said was etch, and left the house. This man is beyond redemption. I had completely lost hope in him. The discharge was scheduled for the next evening, so I busied myself with preparations and paperwork. While packing Charlie's belongings, he suddenly asked me, Mom, do you love Dad? Surprised by the sudden question, I stopped what I was doing. Charlie continued without waiting for my response. Dad doesn't seem interested in me or you. So if you don't love Dad, I want you to divorce and live your life. Charlie must have realized that things weren't going well between John and me, but as a parent, I couldn't let him worry about us till the end. I quickly put on a smile and replied, What are you talking about? I love your dad, and he cares about us too. He's just too busy to visit, so don't worry, okay? But okay, I guess. Charlie didn't seem convinced, but he stopped pursuing the matter. After that, he fell asleep, and I breathed a sigh of relief by his side. Two days later, Charlie passed away at home. John never showed up till the end, and I stayed by Charlie's side, holding his hand. Charlie, Charlie. I cried out loud, clinging to his cooling body, remembering everything from the moment he came into my life. The doctor and a nurse who had been with us since Charlie was young came to mourn with us and explained the next steps. One of them handed me a letter from Charlie's bag. This is from Charlie, he said, to give it to you if anything happened. From Charlie, I received the letter expressing my gratitude to the doctor and the nurse. I was alone without John's help, and Charlie was suffering from his illness. I can only be grateful to those who kindly supported us through this difficult time. After they left, I opened the letter beside Charlie. The content made me cry out in surprise. What is this? Charlie's letter contained not only his gratitude but also something shocking. Reading it, I felt my blood boil. Even as the funeral director came to discuss arrangements, my mind was full of the letter's content. Still, I had to decide on the details for Charlie's sake, planning a small, homey funeral. Then, the day before the funeral, John finally showed his face, still reeking of alcohol. A lull, I had no energy left to confront him. John, noticing my exhaustion, casually commented. You aged, as he took out more alcohol from the fridge to drink. Tomorrow is Charlie's funeral. Where have you been? I told you I was at work. What's with all these complaints? Why did I marry such a man? No, without him, I wouldn't have met Charlie. My mind was in turmoil. Charlie is no longer with us. 
Oh, yeah, that's right. His attitude, as if Charlie was some distant relative, filled me with simmering anger. But arguing with him was pointless. So I decided to focus on the funeral arrangements for the next day. Lucky me, no more child-rearing expenses. Let's get divorced. I couldn't hide my shock when John suddenly said this during the funeral preparations. I knew he was selfish, but this was too much. There's a woman I want to marry, but she doesn't want kids. So what with Charlie alive, the child support and medical expenses would drain my money. Ah, what a relief, I said, feeling terrible. A chill ran through me that such a man was Charlie's father. As my head cleared, my anger boiled over. I agree to the divorce. Right. Then I'll take the house, so get out as soon as you can. Just wait until after the funeral. Fine with that, John left on the day of the funeral. I read Charlie's will. John turned pale while relatives glared at him with fierce faces. Now it was time for my counterattack. The will I read, written by Charlie, exposed John's affair. Until I read the will at the funeral, John had been playing the role of a grieving father, crying loudly. How could such a letter? No, it's not true. It's a prank, right, Natasha? John tried to deny it, appearing very pathetic. I silently took out an envelope from my bag and thrust photos in front of John. What? You took pictures. Troubled by being caught in a photo like being seen with the woman, your arm and arm within this picture. Ah, no. As John stumbled over his words, his face still pale, I smiled sweetly and asked the relatives to pass around a few photos I had. Whispers of disgust and small cries of shock arose from all around. Despicable. Not visiting his frail son, but with this woman in such a scandalous manner. The glares at John intensified, and he slumped down in his seat. I then presented John with the divorce papers. He looked up at me in shock, his voice cracking as if he was about to cry. You didn't pay attention to me because you were always nursing him. It was just a fling, forgive me. I don't want a divorce. Not paying attention? You're not a child. I repeatedly asked you to help me nurse him, but you always ran away, claiming work as an excuse. But nursing is dirty. As soon as John said that, he disappeared from my view, and when I looked down, he was crawling on the floor with my father-in-law standing over him, breathing heavily. You? What do you mean nursing your own son is dirty? Enough with the jokes. A parent who doesn't care for their child isn't a parent at all. You're the lowest of the low. My in-laws had always adored Charlie. They celebrated every hospital discharge with a meal, bought Charlie his favorite things, and never missed a visit. They had been covering for John, believing his excuses about being busy at work, never imagining their own son could be such a disgrace. Tears streaked their faces as they glared at John, who sat in disbelief, clutching his cheek where he'd been struck. Natasha, I'm so sorry. We had no idea. If we knew he was such a man, we would have encouraged you to divorce him sooner. We are truly sorry, they began to bow deeply, and I hurried to lift them up. It wasn't their fault. Charlie loved his grandparents, and their presence was one reason I hadn't divorced John. You guys are not to blame. Look, Charlie's letter says thank you and stay healthy. Charlie, and I both love you very much. Natasha, thank you. Sorry, my mother-in-law hugged me, sobbing quietly. My father-in-law was also crying, apologizing to me. John, finally coming to his senses, stood up and pointed at me, yelling, Don't be ridiculous. She's just an old lady who couldn't even take care of her husband, a failure of a wife. John, you. As my father-in-law lunged towards John, I stepped in front of John. He looked at me with a fearful yet defiant glare. What? 
You've got something to say? Not really. This is reality. No one here is on your side. And make sure to pay back the money you've borrowed from many people, haven't you? How do you know about that? At my words, relatives who had lent John money began murmuring. After reading Charlie's letter, I had contacted the relatives. Charlie had overheard John's expensive activities involving a woman from a nightclub who loved lavish things like brand products and overseas trips. John paying for all of it could never afford such a lifestyle on his salary alone. Realizing this, I had checked if anyone had lent him money, and to my surprise, it wasn't just John's relatives, but mine as well. Under the pretense of Charlie's medical expenses, while I had initially informed them just to thank and promise repayment, with the current situation, they realized John had used the money not for Charlie but for his affair. Don't joke with me. I lent that money thinking it was for Charlie. Give me back my $20,000 right now. Same here. I want my $40,000 back. These words set off a cascade of demands from various relatives for the money they had lent. John looked around, his face turning even paler with each claim. Then he turned to me, smiling weakly. Natasha, we're a couple, right? You'll help me, won't you? What? Are you serious? You didn't help with nursing, didn't contribute to the medical expenses or even the living expenses, and instead borrowed from everyone for your own selfish needs. Unbelievable. Why would I help you? Don't say things like that. With a pathetic voice, John slumped back down, seemingly out of energy to retort. I looked down at him, ready to deliver the final blow, and called to the entrance. Cheryl, please come in. Cheryl, why is she here? John's face was a picture of sheer panic as he stared at the entrance. The woman named Cheryl walked towards me hesitantly. She looked plain with light makeup, a stark contrast to the woman in the photos. I invited her on Charlie's last day. She was with you, right? I thought it would be nice if she could attend the funeral. Um, I'm sorry about this, Cheryl said weakly. Save it. No need for such superficial words. Cheryl closed her mouth tightly at my response, her face as pale as John's. I handed her some documents. I called you here today to sign these. Please read them carefully and sign. One hundred thousand dollars? I can't pay that. It's impossible. It's not for you to decide whether you can pay or not. Cheryl looked at me with pleading eyes, but I wasn't about to let her off easily. His gesture irritated me, but I had no intention of snapping over such a thing. Then John, trembling, stood between Cheryl and me. What now? It's my fault, so please forgive Cheryl. Demanding $100,000 from her is just too cruel. Why should I? I'm merely asking for compensation for the affair. John raised his eyebrows and sighed heavily, while screaming inside that I'm the one who wants to sigh. I waited for John's next words. That's because Cheryl is fragile, unlike you. How do you expect her to earn $100,000? How cruel can you be, John? Cheryl clung to John's back, both seemingly lost in each other. The cold stares weren't only from me. The relatives were ready to give them a piece of their mind, but I decided to add fuel to the fire. Cheryl, your son is hospitalized, right? Son? Cheryl flinched. I continued, he's twelve, just like Charlie was, always in the hospital. Your ex-husband took custody, right? Tough with all the hospital and treatment costs, not to mention the bed fees. You must be getting quite a demand for child support, aren't you? How? How do you know that? Cheryl looked at me as if she'd seen a ghost. John was frozen in shock. I pulled out some documents from my bag and handed them to John. He shackily read them, then suddenly pushed Cheryl away. Hey, what's this? 
divorced with a kid? You never told me. Didn't you say the money was for your family living far away? I didn't lie. My son is my family, so I've been with a used woman. Where's the true love you were after, my money? You were only after my body. Cheryl threw her shoe at John, enraged. John lunged at her, and they started brawling like children. But fortunately, a security guard intervened. I approached the disheveled pair with a smile. John, please sign the divorce papers and arrange for the alimony. Cheryl, I won't reduce your compensation by a single cent, and your ex-husband said something about your affairs being a sickness that can't be cured. Seems like you have a few partners, so with that kind of leeway, expect enforced payments for the child support, treatment costs, and alimony. That's impossible. John hung his head, speechless, and Cheryl was led away by the security. Her shoulders slumped in defeat. I apologized to each relative for the disturbance, and they comforted me, bringing me to tears. After that, my divorce from John was finalized, and we also agreed on the amount of alimony he had to pay, just as I had requested. This incident infuriated his parents tremendously. Moreover, the extended family was outraged to discover they had been deceived too, giving him the cold shoulder. Of course, he was asked to return the money he embezzled, and it seems like he borrowed it from some shady sources. To repay the debt, he's been working his fingers to the bone with multiple jobs, but the repayment is so huge that he's rumored to have nothing left for living expenses. Eventually, unable to keep up with the ballooning interest, last month he was taken away by some intimidating guys. His parents don't even intend to file a missing person report, so while I hope he's safe, I can't help but wish he suffers unimaginable pain. As for Cheryl, all the men she dated found out about her affairs and the child she had, cutting off all financial support. At 30, she's considered old for her line of work, struggling to attract clients, and eventually had to turn to her parents. She paid the alimony in one lump sum. However, she's since been sent to work on a farm on some island, with her wages going directly to her parents for debt repayment. As for me, I moved with Charlie's memorial tablet. I bought a house near the ocean, something Charlie always wanted, and now live there alone with the cat he wished for. I look forward to the times when my in-laws visit, and we...